My name is Yolanda Jones. I'm Assistant Director for Computer and Information Services at Villanova Law Library, and I'm going to be doing the first portion of this session called Supercharging um, Websites with Databases. Um, what I'm going to be talking about in my portion of this program is a project that I worked on last year um, called the Federal Web Navigator. And as these types of projects often start, um, I was approached and asked, oh, do you think that you can you know, put a database of, of federal agency websites on the web? And I prep answers the same thing that many of you would ask. So we just, sure, no problem, can do. And then promptly turned away and thought about, okay, now let's see, how do you actually run database software and then, you know, how do you actually put it onto the web? So um, this is just going to be a kind of warts and all look at the process that I went through uh, to put this um, database together. Um, let me see if I can um, give you an example of the finished uh, product, which you can actually find uh, in our uh, library web pages. Um, I actually had some um, handouts um, on one of the chairs in the back there by the door that kind of has like a list of links and other information on it. So um, if you don't already have it, you can look for it um, once the uh, program is over. Uh, but once I have up my uh, uh, law school library webpage, I'm clicking on a link called the um, Internet Legal Research Compass, which this federal web navigator is a part of. And under federal research, let me actually go to the page. This page actually gives um, users a choice in how they can search for the federal agency websites. They can either do a search by the name of the agency, which I'm going to try and cross my fingers that the <coughs> server on the back end is actually working. And then um, I get a result which has. Um, a live hypertext link. And each of the results on that page came from um, a Microsoft Access database. And we put this database on the web um, using Windows MT and the Microsoft Internet Information Server. Um, on the other side, um, on the search by um, subject side, um, I just had some kind of CAM searches already programmed into the, to the link when I click on it. Um, it does a subject search. So as I said, this is going to be kind of like a really practical look at how um, I put together this database. And one of the things that I found out about this is that particularly if you're really just kind of starting out like on a really small project just to kind of get your feet wet um, working with databases, to start out with, you don't actually have to be a programmer. I'm not. Uh, and you don't have to know everything about you know, databases um, to be able to start to do um, a little bit with um, databases. Um, one of the things I particularly liked about this Federal Web Navigator database was that, well, you know, it had over 800 um, links to websites in it, um, but to keep it up to date, all I have to do is just change the one set of data that's in the Microsoft Access Web, um, uh, Microsoft Access Database, and the uh, web is automatically updated. However, there were a few um, disadvantages to it. Now, I, I do say a um, large initial cost is something you have to deal with, particularly if you don't already have you know, some type of database software or service software um, already available. Now, it just so happened that at my own school, we had a site license with Microsoft. So clearly, the price was right to try you know, something with these Microsoft products. Um, also, there's a kind of a hidden cost involved in all of this that has to do with um, your time. Um, and because you, if you don't um, already have some familiarity with working with databases um, and putting them on the web, then you're going to spend a fair amount of time initially just kind of figuring out um, how to put it all together. And then, of course, once you've got the database up and running on the web, then you start to get maintenance issues by keeping up to date and uh, keeping um, the server running. Now, the type of database that I did in this project, had, uh, my project, really was kind of an, an information um, access type of application. 
And you may want to do something totally different, you know, with the types of databases that you have in mind or to develop or already developing. And really the types of uses that you can put these databases to really kind of depends on the types of organization you're in, uh, the types of data that you're dealing with, what type of services um, that you provide, you know, what your needs are. Um, if anybody went to a prior session um, that was on um, databases uh, just prior to this, you know, they had, um, you know, career services database. You have things like event scheduling or, you know, putting up exams. Um, now, my project was also somewhat easy in, in the fact that since I was the one who kind of designed the database, I knew what type of data, you know, I, you know, I kind of had in mind. Um, so, you know, it was pretty easy in that sense for me to know what my own needs were. Um, but what you might find out is particularly if you are not the one, you know, who's going to, at the end of the day, be actually using the data, you might find that you're actually going to have to have some really uh, close, um, you know, conversations with um, the end users trying to make sure that you don't wind up, you know, coming up with the product and then they're not, you know, satisfied with it and you have to go back and do um, a lot of work. Uh, now, what do you actually need to put a database on the web? Well, first of all, you need database software. As I said, the software that I chose for this particular um, project was Microsoft Access. However, I would say it's probably on the low end of the types of uh, database software that you might consider using. Um, a lot of people use um, Oracle um, or Microsoft uh, SQL Server um, that, that can um, better kind of scale for larger um, applications. Um, you also need the database and the data to put in it. And of course, that's kind of like that old Steve Martin joke, like, well, how do you become a millionaire? Well, first, you get a million dollars, you know, right? So, like, how do you put, you know, a database on the web? Well, first of all, you kind of have to have, you know, the database in place. And for some of you, you already have a database that you're already working with, you know, but if you don't, then you're dealing with the dual issues of putting the database together, you know, as well as putting it on the web. Um, you need the um, sort of a hardware and software and uh, this particular database is actually running off of a Pentium um, computer um, that um, our network administrators uh, put together. Um, and uh, you need web editing software. I use Microsoft Front Page, once again, part of our licensing agreement. And of course, like, you need the, the internet access. But I would say probably one of the most important elements of putting together one of these database projects is probably the people. And particularly if you are going to have like a larger database, you want to try to assemble maybe as many people as possible to kind of work on this. I mean, even for my own little database with the 800 uh, links to, to federal websites, um, um, I worked with a network administrator to administer our, our NG service. That he's sitting right over there. Martin McDonald couldn't live without him. Um, you know, so in that sense, I'm very lucky you know, to be in an environment where you know, have that type of, of support. But also involved in this project is a reference librarian who's looking for new sites and you know trying to keep track of changes. Um, I got a student assistant who I must admit they're a wonderful thing when you can get them. I got them for the first time for this particular um, uh, project and you know they um, kind of input a lot of data into the database. Um, and then of course there was a coordinator me. Uh, you know I designed you know the database and, and tried to make sure that um, you know everything kind of uh, got done on on time. Uh, now, actually, what I did was I took a screen snapshot of uh, a few screens uh, from my uh, database. This particular database um, actually was Access 97. Um, but you'll notice that actually what I have up um, is a screen that has several different tabs on it that includes um, uh, tabs that say tables, queries, forms, reports. If you haven't, you know, worked with a database before, those are the objects, you know, that um, the database software uses to be able to um, put the data into the database, uh, manipulate it, and retrieve the data. You know, probably the most important uh, one of these objects is the tables tab, which is the one that I have shown. And this is where actually I found out I really had to spend a lot of time uh, working on this database because if you I don't have a really good design, you know, for your database when you first start out, you will probably wind up having problems with the database from you know the beginning of time, probably showing up even before you even try to get the database on the web. You know, but you know, if you have so if it doesn't really hang together right at the beginning, uh, the problems just kind of grow exponentially as you go along. Now, in this particular design that I came up with, the main um, table that I put together was called the links table. And that's where I had the basic information about the websites, the name of the database. 
um, the URL, um, and commentary. And then I also had some fields in that links table that kind of looked up information from the other tables that I put together. Um, so for example, I put together a table called government groups. It was basically kind of like a branch of government type of thing, um, you know, executive, legislative, judicial. Um, with the mind course, later on I may want to have a link where I say, well, show, click here and we'll show you, you know, all of the legislative, you know, branch. Um, uh, related um, items in the database. Um, I also have a table called a parent agency because I figured that, well, we might have actually some entries in the database where it's actually several sub-agencies under one parent agency. And so a future um, uh, uh, option that I wanted to uh, put into place was to be able to click on the parent agency and also get a list of all of the links that we have in the database um, that were connected with that parent agency. And then the subject um, table, well, that's, that's the, um, uh, just being able to put in all of the subjects once and being able to look up that information in order to do a subject search. And you'll notice that basically what I said was that I was describing some options where I have not implemented those options yet. But I tried my best to try to plan out, you know, kind of on paper what it was that eventually I wanted to do you know, to try to get as much of this in place as possible because I kind of found out that in this, in this particular type of project, you know, you think, oh, I'll come back later, and it turns out that there really is no later, you know, it's, it's, it's just up there. Uh, now, to put those tables together, um, what I found out is that Microsoft Access um, has built into it a lot of different, uh, you know, kind of templates and wizards, you know, that you can use to try to, um, you know, simplify uh, the process. I also found out, though, that because the type of database that I was used, uh, trying to put together was so different from just like a general business type application, um, I really had to do a lot of modification. You know, I tried to start out with their, you know, with, with, with their wizards, but I wound up having to do a lot of modification behind the scenes um, to, um, to make it match my own individual um, situation. Um, I, I even took a look at some other Microsoft Access databases. In particular, they have like the sample database called the North Wind database, which you know, for the longest time I ignored. You know, and then finally, you know, one of the help documents that looked at the North Wind database, when I looked in there, I found out that, oh, wait a minute, you know, they actually have some things already put together where you can actually see, you know, how somebody else implemented a solution to a problem that was very similar. Um, to the one that um, I was looking at. And if the Northwind database isn't actually already installed, when you um, open up Access, you can install it from the Microsoft Access database. Now, this is actually um, a snapshot of, of a view of the links table, that main table that I was talking to you about. And you can actually only see maybe a couple of the, the fields that I actually had in there, the URL, which Microsoft Access put in as a live hypertext and I thought, oh wow, there's a live hypertext link in there, so there should be no problem when I, you know, save this thing out to the web. It'll work automatically. <laughs> what could be easier? You know, that, was, that was the famous last words there. Um, then also, the uh, name uh, uh, field um, also kind of highlights another problem that I ran into where I didn't exactly totally think out the design of my database correctly. Because you'll notice that in many of the items, it might start out with something like USDA or um, OMB. And actually, in point of fact, when I put together my web form to search this database, I said, well, you know, type in the name of an agency or the abbreviation of the agency, and it will search for it. And I kind of jury rigged it to work by putting the abbreviation for the agency in the name field. So that's actually doing like a keyword search for those two items in the name field. Actually, probably what I should have done was had another field, you know, that was the abbreviation field, you know, that would search, um, uh, kind of search that separately. You know, so Microsoft Access, as, as it turned out, you know, was pretty forgiving. You know, because after I went through all of this and looked through help files and went to the Microsoft website and looked up a lot of things, I finally, you know, started reading through some of these, you know, um, big, hefty, thousand-page books that they, you know, kind of sell on, you know, how to use Microsoft Access. And really, you know, it's worthwhile to really go through some of those Bibles, particularly the database design parts in the beginning, you know, because I would have kind of gone on that fact about the normalization of, of data to try to make it so that, you know, each table, you know, kind of has a, a data in it that is pretty much standard one. Um, okay, so this is just kind of reiterating um, some of the planning 
uh, details I talk, was, was talking a little bit about. In particular, you know, really trying to focus on well, what you know, do you want your database to do? And then if you say, oh, I want my database to be able to search by subject, you know, then you start thinking, oh, then I might need to have a field in the database that actually you know, has the subjects in it. So that's how I just start to kind of put that together. Uh, now, in this particular database, it actually involved a large amount of links from federal government uh, websites. And I really only had a short amount of time to actually get the database up and running. And instead of trying to retype all of the data in um, and possibly have some types of like, transcription errors, uh, basically what I realized was that if Microsoft Access, you can, it can import tables from other databases. And when I looked at some of the bookmark um, management software, you know, that's on there, when I you know, actually looked at some of the files, well, it turns out that they're actually in a file format, in a database file format that's compatible with Microsoft Access. And so I wound up actually, you know, doing a lot of bookmarking in Netscape. I had my student assistant bookmarking a lot of these websites in Netscape and then took the bookmark file and put it into one of those bookmark converters and then imported it in, which at least got in the name and the um, URL, you know, of the database without having to do a lot of typing. You know, so, you know, whatever type of database that you're going to be, you know, kind of uh, deciding to do, you probably want to also pay a lot of attention to, you know, how are you going to get the database, uh, the data into the database without killing yourself. You know, particularly if you have like a large amount of data to do so. Usually, you know, there's some way that you can import, you know, large amounts of data, and this is the way that I figured it out um, for this particular project. Um, once I got the um, table into the database, I used the type of query that's called an append query to get the data in. Um, after that tables tab on that first screen I showed you, there was another tab that said queries, and where the tables um, kind of hold um, the data basically in one viewpoint. The queries um, actually allow you to um, perform operations um, on that data and show different views of the data set depending upon the search that you've, that you've done. And in this case, this is what an append query looked like where, where it said fields and there were three different fields that I was actually um, importing. And so the top field line were the tables, uh, the fields from the table that I was importing and then where it said append to, well, those were the field names from my links table that I wanted the material to go to. And then I would just like click on the data exclamation point to run, you know, the append query, and the, the data would be um, appended in. Now there are other types of queries, of course, that you, that you can do. You know, like, well, I want to do a search for, um, you know, I want to show all of the documents that have the word White House and the name, which you'll probably have like one or two, and that query, once you run that query, you'll see your same set of data, but you'll only see, you know, the two entries that match, you know, the query. Um, next to the query tab, um, I believe, or um, near the query tab, there was another tab that was called reports, um, which is um, another way that the database allows you to output the information. And actually, you can use, like, their web publishing wizard that's in access to export a, a report as a static HTML page and just leave it at that. If you have like some data that doesn't really change, you know, very often, you know, you may just want to save it to the web as a static uh, page. And in this case, this is an old, other project that I worked on where um, I put in a law school um, examination, both examination index into a Microsoft Access database so that we could have a book of students to refer to um, when they wanted to go to the circulation desk and get their information. Um, however, what most people want to do is kind of like use a form, you know, to try to interactively get the information um, from the database. And I think I showed you an example where I typed in CIA and, you know, the data came back. And this is actually the code from that form that I showed you at the beginning um, of the session. And you'll notice that in bold, in the second line, it says like, a action equal agency name one dot ASP. And that's the name of my active server page that was actually um, getting the data from the database. And then the field that, that I was um, searching was the main field, which is in the input type line. Um, now, Microsoft Access, Access Active Server Pages, they were designed to work um, with the Microsoft uh, Internet Information Server. And um, a very non-technical explanation of all this, because I'm a 
very non-technical <laughs> type of person, is that it's a type of page that includes both HTML code that is processed by um, the web browser as well as code that's processed by the server. And when you get the resulting page back, um, it kind of combines the two together um, and you have your result. <laughs> um, I put in a little example of um, some ASP code uh, from that agency name, one that ASP page, for you to take a look at. It was actually like some fairly longish code, but this was a, a, a fairly significant portion, as, as I found out, because this is the part that actually constructs the live hypertext link. When I clicked on that CIA webpage and it went you know, there, the first time I tried to output the information from the database, the information output is fine, you know, but the, the URL was not live, and I clicked on it, you know, nothing happened. And I actually wound, actually wound up having to do some research, and in fact, I found the answer in the Deja News discussion forum, you know, because somebody said in there, hey, did you know that that feature that Microsoft put in there doesn't work the way it's supposed to? It doesn't actually output the correct code. Here's the code that will work. And I was like, oh, and then, you know, put it in there, and it sure did. Um, so it starts off with the anchor reference that you would normally see when you're actually putting together um, a URL. And then after that, there's like this little percent symbol, which is really kind of, I believe, kind of delineates where the server, you know, is supposed to actually start uh, processing the information. And so here, where it says rs.fields, I think it's a record set. And then it's supposed to look at all the fields, find the one that's called URL, and then put whatever that value is in that spot. Um, and so then also, and then also um, I decided to have the, um, I believe when you clicked on it, you could, see, you could actually see the URL that you were clicking on, and that's why it's just kind of like repeating the same thing. So when you click the URL, and then also put in the anchor reference to make the high, live um, hypertext link. Now, I did not write, as I said, that code from scratch. I found it, you know, somewhere else. But the page I actually started out with, I actually had Microsoft Access generated. And also Microsoft Front Page also has some um, um, ASP generation tools that you can also can also use. Uh, but basically I wound up, as I said, generating the ASP page from Microsoft Access. I activated the like web publishing wizard. And I said, oh, I want to um, you know, publish you know, this you know, query or you know, what have you. And then they would ask what format do you want it in? And you know, when I said ASP, it, 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 all you have to do is indicate where you wanted that to publish. Um, as I said, if you're a programmer, well, a lot of programmers actually know how to um, do the little ASP pages from, from scratch. And, you know, of course, we do that. God bless you. <laughs> um, okay. Now, the other thing that I did want to point out about those active server pages is that you not only um, have the language that, you know, made that link work, but you also have to have a language in there that extracted the data from the database that actually did the search. And in most databases, um, that is going to be done in SQL, or Structured Query Language, um, which allows you to search your database and retrieve a result. And here's a little example of the um, SQL command, like the last line that's in red, where it says, like, select star, which means all the fields, from links, which was the name of the table you know, that I showed you, where name, which is the, the name field I told you was, is what we were searching, is like, you know, whatever they put into the form. You know, that's, you know, basically, you know, what that, you know, kind of means. And that was enough to get the search to work. Um, and just kind of to summarize, as I said, uh, this, this particular setup was designed to work with NT Information Server. Um, you could save the report as um, a report as a static page. Um, you can also, um, you know, use the public to publish in the web wizard to create um, active server pages. Now, of course, there's one little line in there that I haven't explained yet because at the bottom I said, this works using ODBC or Open Database Connectivity. And that's one of those kind of like, well, you know, for one of, uh, I mean, the shoe was lost. To make all of this work, you actually have to make sure that the network connectivity settings are set, um, you know, correctly. And um, so with, the, with the, ODBC, uh, the ODBC settings, though, that is in the control panel. Um, and it comes with, um, you know, Windows 98, Windows 2000. I think you could install it from a CE um, for, you know, Windows 95. Um, and I believe I also should mention that once you get all this information into the database, how are you going to update it? For the type of information that I have, 
one thing I found out was that there's this program called Link Check, you know, that actually will open up your Microsoft Access database and check to see whether all of your URLs are active. I mean, other places you can do it are to kind of output your um, list of URLs and have a, um, a, a, some, a link checker on my like, uh, Net Mechanic do it, or Microsoft front page itself, you know, has a link, you know, checker in there. Um, but there were like all these kind of details, like keeping everything up to date, um, that um, you kind of have to kind of work your way through. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is kind of stop here and um, turn over the podium to um, Ms. Prada Hardy from um, our William & Mary School of Law. And um, once again, um, uh, there's a lot of different information, places you go to get information, like printed books, websites. I have this uh, presentation um, on the web, and I do have uh, copies of handouts that are, I'll put on the chair in the back um, if you didn't already get one. And um, or they're on the table that can hand in the back. And um, I'm, I'm open for, um, I guess, we'll hold questions. Maybe we'll Wait, what, why don't you? If you have questions, why don't you answer now? It'll take me a couple of minutes to switch my laptop to be working in the okay. next couple of minutes. You That's right. Questions. But thank you for your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. What would you have done if you have found that, uh, that tip on the day on Oh, I probably would have just kept looking through um, books. I looked in the Microsoft support website. Um, I actually, at one point, um, I never, never got that far, but once I, I hit another program, uh, problem where I wound up actually calling Microsoft, you know, and, and it actually turned out that they were very helpful. I don't know about you guys, but I know that there's some, you know, people that <laughs> think that they're not the, you know, the greatest, but um, uh, eventually they're quite helpful. What was the time frame on that whole database? Three months. Um, but I must say that it took me probably like about a month and a half to actually figure out how to work it, <laughs> how to put it together. Um, and then after that, once I figured out the methods for getting all the data in and, you know, put the, you know, student assistance to work, it was actually pretty quick to get the database. Do you have to run access on the server? How do you move the database over to um, I know that we're, we're running uh, Microsoft Access on the, on the Windows NT server. But I believe the way the ODBC settings work, you don't actually have to to, to, take, to do it that way. Um, so I might refer that question to um, our network administrator who put it up there. Um, but that about right? Yeah. Yes, you don't have to, but it's easier for us to do it. So you're volunteering to do it then for? <laughs> it's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to sort of spin off of what Yolanda's talked about and, and uh, take you through a couple more things that you can do with databases. Some of it requires a little bit of, of more detailed knowledge, if, and if you don't have that yet, at least you can sort of get the concept and see the kind of things that can be done. And I'm, I'm going to cover two things. One is sort of the difference between static and live updating and when you might use one and when you might use the other. And the second thing is um, how you might use these techniques to integrate a law school, principally an internal web, an intranet, with your uh, university databases, which may or may not be on mainframes or whatever. Uh, but there's a way you can integrate those with a website as well. So let's start talking about the difference between live and static updating and when you pick one or when you pick the other. Um, when most people think about databases, like Yolanda was talking about, you're mostly thinking about live something. You create a web page somehow that when someone queries it, the web page at that moment has code or scripting in it that will then call on a database, pull the information out of the database, format it and present it to the user who's using a web browser. That's what I think of as live updating. It's on the fly as soon as somebody asks for it. But it's um, also possible to take the same general approach of stuff in a database and have it create a web page sort of statically that just once the web page is created, it sits there ready to be delivered to a user until the next time that page is updated from the database. So that's static. When the user actually asks for the page, the page is already there, it's already waiting, and it just pops up and, and uh, is displayed for them. And you can do a whole lot of stuff. We have, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about an event calendar system that we use at uh, William & Mary uh, on our internal web, but it's also uh, used to some extent for our uh, public website as well. But just to show you how flexible this stuff is, I'm, I'm going to give you three screenshots are, that are event calendar displays, all of which came from the same Microsoft Access 97 database, two of which are, are come out live and one of which is generated statically. But um, 
but they're all from the same database, which is, just shows you the flexibility and the power of this kind of approach. Here's the first display is actually sort of a monthly calendar where the events are displayed on the proper day, and each event is a live link. If you click on that, you get more details. And that's generated on the fly. When, when somebody asks for the, the event calendar in this format, it goes to Microsoft Access, requests the events for that month, puts them in the right format, and pops them out to the user. And that's done live. And this is a second type of display that's also done live. Same thing. At the time the person or user requests these events, Microsoft Access is queried, the events are formatted, and this is the same, same database, just a little more detail, somewhat different format for a different purpose, um, but also generated live. Now finally, we have another uh, static generation. This page is generated, again, out of the same Microsoft Access database of events, but it's generated once every day at, in the middle of the night. If you, in fact, if you can see up in the, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but right up over here, it says, updated, da da da, at 2.02 a.m. That's because we have this thing automatically. This page is produced every night at 2 a.m. And when users then ask for it, they're getting that static page. But on the other hand, it's never more than 24 hours old. It's always cranked out overnight. Um, I don't have a lot of links. You might wonder, well, why, why do some live? Why do some static? What's, what's the difference? And most people think live has all the advantages because the updating is instant. As soon as somebody updates the database, the next time somebody queries, it's automatically there. But there's some good reasons to have both. What we do in our system, the live updating is done. Um, I can't quite see that, can you? Is there a tech person here who knows how to slide this over? Well, I can, I can read it to you. It says live. We do this for our, well, our intranet, our internal web, for instance, people within the law school have access to this. It runs on Microsoft Access. Microsoft Access can't handle a huge number of simultaneous queries. But for an internal website, there aren't a huge number of simultaneous queries. It's just you know, students and faculty and staff at our law school. Uh, and, and if it's live and something goes wrong, it's not that big a deal. It's just, it's just us, right? And so that's not so bad. And finally, our internal web does run on NT, and all these things that Yolanda's been talking about, using front page if you want or whatever, all work because this all works on an NT server. The reason we do one, one of those pages statically is that that's a page that shows up on our external web where all the world can see if they want to. Uh, we're not sure that Microsoft Access could take care of that. Or we, in our dreams, it can't, because our dreams are that we have 5,000 people a second you know, hitting our website or 50,000 people. But anyway, we're not sure whatever the load is that it can handle it. Uh, and, in, and finally, our external web server is not an NT machine. It's a Unix machine running whatever it runs. And this, the, the, the prescribed database stuff for that machine is uh, Cold Fusion, which uh, at this moment I don't know how to use yet either. So for that reason, that all that external stuff is generated statically overnight because once it's generated, it's just a page of HTML code. It doesn't call on a database at that point. It doesn't need a live link at that point. It's just a page. And we can pop that over on the Unix server and then it'll show up to anybody just like any page will. So we have, I think, a blend of both live and static. Um, you might wonder, well, how do you do it? How do you do it statically? One way is sort of the way that Yolanda has talked about. We do it a little bit differently. If you have a web page already that has a proper, I'm sorry. Oh, is that <laughs> uh, if you have a web page that's geared up to do stuff live, that it will, you know, when it's queried, it knows how to go to the database and it knows how to format the results and deliver them to the user, you can interrupt it at that last second and rewrite the code so that instead of delivering the page to the user, it delivers it to a file. And that's otherwise all the same code works in the same way. It's just that it doesn't actually pop it out to the user, it pops it into a file. And that's the difference between doing it live and doing it statically. So um, what I did was went through some of our pages that we wanted to produce statically. So here's just a page of HTML, and you, even though you can't see it, they're HTML tags and stuff like that. It's just an ordinary page. And if you want that to be the end result, if you want that to be put out in, so you can load it onto a Unix server or something, you end up, and if you're not a programmer, this won't mean a whole lot to you, but you write some code that sort of assembles all that page into some variables and then writes those variables out to a file, and boom, there's your page. And in fact, we actually emulate, a, because I'm used, I use front page, we actually create a page that looks like a front page, page to page, front page. <laughs> it's got all the little doohickeys in there that front page wants to see. Front page wants to see that you have borders and not. Well, we just write all that stuff out. I mean, we did it by just looking at a front page page, and then just creating all those tags the way front page wanted them. So then it becomes part of another front page web, but it's all done statically. It's generated statically. 
Um, if you end up doing this, one of the things you'll find is, well, how do you trigger those updates? What, what is the mechanism by which every day at 2 a.m. So a page is generated so that it's available on the Unix server? And you can do it a different way. So what we do is we have, you have a web page that performs that update. It has all that scripting and all the code that writes out the files. And what we need to do is to trigger that updating web page every night at 2 a.m. And there's a, there's a very sort of cute way to do that. Um, if you've ever used Internet Explorer, you know that there's a, uh, in the earlier version something called subscribe to a website, and in the current version it's make available offline. You can create a, a link to the web page that generates the static file. You take that link and you tell Internet Explorer, I want to subscribe to that link and I want you to update it every night at 2 a.m. And so that is actually what it does. You tell it, make it available offline, make it updated every night at 2 a.m. And every night at 2 a.m., Internet Explorer, through its own timing mechanism, will try to refresh that, that little link. And in the process of refreshing that link, it triggers all the scripts that put out the calendar page that we load up onto the Unix server. And if you want to know what was it updated properly, you just look at that little shortcut on your desktop, right click it, pick properties, and it will tell you when it was last updated. And so you know if it, if it generated the, the file that you want. So that's, that's sort of static versus live. Uh, it's a spin off on what Yolanda is talking about. We find it very helpful and very useful if you're not in an NT environment for the actual delivery of web pages to end users. The second thing I want to talk about is um, doing some of these same techniques to integrate uh, your website with bigger university-wide databases. Uh, and I'm mostly now talking about internal uh, web pages, since that's mostly what I think you'll find useful. You can actually integrate your own website with university mainframe databases if you meet a few requisites. The mainframe database has to be available by means of what Yolanda has already described as ODBC, a standard form of connecting to databases and to be able to use SQL queries. Most databases available today can do that. I mean, it would be rare to find a database that could not do that. Um, the harder thing is sort of political. You have to get permission from the people who run those things you know, to let you connect to them, and that's a bigger deal. Um, and they were quite reluctant, actually. But once you get that permission, then you have to have somebody who knows how the university databases are structured, what the fields are, what they mean, uh, and so forth. But if you can do all that, then you're good. So what you find is you have, let's say, an internal web page, and you want to update it with stuff. You can use this ODBC connection from Microsoft Access. That's what we've talked about so far. And what I'm now adding to that picture is, is another step, where you take that Microsoft Access database, and you connect it through ODBC to your university mainframe databases. All right, so it's sort of a two-step process, database to database, database to web. All right, so that's the connection. Now, you might want to know, well, why do you want to connect to a university mainframe database? What, what, what's in there that you might want? And typically, at least at our school, um, typically you have a lot of basic administrative stuff. People's names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, lists of students, lists of courses, who's taking what course, all that stuff that we want to make available on our internal website site. And it's all in the university. Right now, it's in an IBM mainframe in DB2. Uh, if we we're going to be converting it over to Oracle or SAP or SOAP or whatever it is. But at the moment, it's in an IBM mainframe using DB2. Now, granted, what everybody wants to be able to do is to find the holy grail where the connection is direct and immediate from whatever your database is, boom, right to the website. And with modern stuff, you can do that. We're just not there because we don't have the modern stuff implemented yet. And it's going to be several years before we do. So instead of trying to wait around for the direct Oracle, whatever, connection, boom, right to the web, we do it this way, and we just say, let the vision of the Holy Grail fade, and who cares? We can do the same thing, it just takes a couple of more steps, but we can do it today. We can do it today. All right, so how do you do that? Well, you just have to realize that in Microsoft Access, you can say, I want to create a new table, okay? Easy. When you do that, you don't have to create the table right there yourself. There is a way that you can say to Access, I want to create a new table, but really all I want to do is point to some database table located somewhere else. I don't want to create it right here. I want you to just point somewhere else. So you, you run Microsoft Access. This is Access 97 that may be a little small to see. But here's the list of tables, much as Yolanda suggested. And then you click New. You have several options. One of them is Link Table. Instead of saying I'm creating a table now, what I want to do is link to some other table. And when you tell it that, it then runs through the same dialog boxes you see all the time that say, well, where? What do you want to link to? Where is it? And you can sort of go off the network neighborhood, 
and find other databases on your LAN or wherever they are and point to them. And, and, and what happens is when you finish, you have uh, in Microsoft Access, you have the normal tables, which look like that. And then you have these little things which say it's a pointer to the outside world. It's a little globe icon. And these, uh, this is Microsoft Access running on a machine in the law school, but all those globular things are um, databases on the IBM mainframe and DB2. Uh, and, they, and they're the students' information and, and you know, a lot of stuff, grades and, and whatnot. More than they, I mean, we don't have access to all those. You can point to them, but when you try to open them, <laughs> they don't all open because we don't have access to them. But we have access to the ones we need. Okay? And once you've set that kind of link up where it points to these mainframe databases, you then write a, you can write a query. Here's what we do anyway. You write a query that will pull the information out of the mainframe and then build a local table in access. Uh, Right? And this is called a make table query. It's just one of the kinds of queries that's built in to access. But you, you create this make table query, which reads the mainframe, <coughs> duplicates the information in the table in access. Right? And once you've done that, all the data you want is in access on your own local machine, but it came from the university mainframe. All right? And then when you have that sort of make table query, these they have a special icon. Everything has an icon, right? And so uh, these are two queries that when you run them, you just say, oh, I want to open that query. What happens is it goes across the network to the IBM mainframe, pulls the data out of those fields in the IBM thing that we want, student name, email address, faculty email address, whatever, brings it back into Access, creates a table in Access, boom, fresh. And we and it's, then you have it. Then you have it where you want it. All right. Um, and we do that with a what I would think of as a static connection rather than a live connection. I don't know. I'm not even sure how to do a live connection, frankly. but. Um, we don't try to do that because when you run that make table query to go find the information and bring it back, the first thing that happens is a password dialog box on our system, a password dialog box opens. And we don't know an easy way to automate that process. Uh, I'm sure you can do it with macros and writing code and stuff, but none of this is required us to write any code. It's all built in access. So we just say, well, we're not going to try to automate it. We don't want to have to write a macro to do that. And besides that, the campus people change the IDs and passwords at least every month for security reasons. So to try to automate that process would just be a nuisance. So instead, we just have somebody run the thing manually from time to time. Somebody at the beginning of the year, somebody does it every day because the list of students and who's enrolled changes frequently. Later in the semester, we do it about once a week. Somebody sits down, opens up Access, runs the make table query, and it gets all freshened up. And it's um, accurate until the next time we want to run it. And it also means that a lot less can go wrong in the process of delivering this information to the end user on the website. And if you want to know what can go wrong, all you have to do is think how many links and connections are there in this little system. And there's a bunch of them, and any one of them can go wrong. So if you were trying to do this as a, a, a live connection on the fly, a break in any one of these things would cause the whole thing to crash. However, we've done it statically. This link is done like, like once a week. And if something fails at that point, we simply have whatever the old information is sitting there anyway. So if you have a backup, as it were. If it doesn't freshen up properly, well, then you've got last week's data. No big deal. And when the user actually calls for it, it's just coming out of the access database like that. So this, there's less to go wrong as well. So that's another plus for doing it sort of statically on one side, even if you're delivering the information live on the other side. You know, bring it in statically, periodically. You're sending it out live. So. Uh, I, it's to wrap it all up, I guess to say you can do a mixture of static and live updating of, of web pages from a database. There are reasons to do one, there are reasons to do the other. You should be aware of both. And as well, using these techniques, keep in mind that you can use ODBC, this database connection business, not only to feed your web page from Microsoft Access, but also to feed Microsoft Access from other university-wide databases, which is a very nice way to get something today that you might otherwise have to wait till the Holy Grail arrives uh, sometime tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Having, having a short, we're going to have to beat ourselves over the head to end up on time. We seem to have ended up more than on time. So there's time for, for questions for uh, either or both of us if people have any more questions they want to ask. Yeah. Uh, I, I think both presentations were excellent. The only thing is, is that uh, do you have a, uh, a printout of these presentations? I, I gather it's going to be made available. I, I don't with me, but it's going to be on the Cali website or something. Is there a Cali person here who knows? I think that there's they will be available uh, somehow or other through Cali, probably over their website.
What's the effective cover limit for how much data the NSX has access to? Oh, uh, it's something like 50 gigabytes, something pretty big. We, I, I don't, I wouldn't worry about it. I'd, I'd worry more about its ability to handle simultaneous queries uh, because it's not designed for that. But in terms of volume of data, it, I, I wouldn't worry about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the question is, how much data can Microsoft Access handle? How big a database can you do? And I, I, I think it's something like 50 gigabytes of data, or something. It's huge. It's not the limit. The limit is really Access's ability to, to handle web queries simultaneously. And if you have more than 10 or 20 people hitting the database live, it'll start to bog down. But that's simultaneously. That means really right at the same time. If you, if you don't have more than 5 or 10 people at exactly the same instant, Access can deliver it fine on, the, on a website. And the volume of data can hold is really huge, so I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. I have a question. You're talking about static versus live. Did you? My impression was that the static was you were posting the report, not really the database. Um, that's, you know, this, static means different things, I guess, to different people. Yolanda talked about a technique where you go into Access and you create something Access calls a report, which is primarily designed to be printed out on paper. But you can say, I want to export this report to the web, all right? And it will then produce a file, and that's itself static. It's just a web page with stuff in it, and you can then put that on your web server. What I'm talking about is not actually, you could do that, I suppose, with Access, but we don't do it. Instead, we have a web page that pulls information out of Access, but instead of that web, that web page passing it on to a user, that web page actually writes it out to yet another page, and that page is then put on the web server. So it's, it's, You could do it either way, I think. Can you query it? You, uh, not live. No. No, I mean, not the static live. data that you can query. No, the static data is just a web page with no, by the time it finishes, like that event calendar, there's nothing to query. It's just a list of events that are upcoming and it's updated every you know, day or every week, but you, there's nothing to query from there. Yeah, if you want the kind of system where somebody pull, puts in information in a form, it has to be live, then you have to do it live. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Just a comment. Um, another example of this type of connectivity, if anyone has their whole pack from the Endeavor, Voyager databases. The latest release, well, a little behind a little bit for us, the 99.1 release, includes some sample uh, tables, queries, and reports that never provides, mm -hmm. which uh, once you run and link up, in fact, I think there's a wizard to help you link up to really be seen with your database. For, for a lot. And I mean, but you're, you're running live in a separate uh, yeah. connection. trying to do next is have some custom display of data from our OPAC here on the web page here for public use or for internet. Yeah. Well, you can, do, you can do that formatting you know, in, uh, with some sort of scripting, which is what we do with the event calendar. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Robert, um, are you um, still posting your Another database, database man. Still coding by hand? Or have you started using any code generation? No. I'm, I, this, this is what you're looking at. I've just done myself by hand. Um, for future applications, we're going to have to go to Cold Fusion because that's a supported technology, and I don't know what we'll do. with. I, I haven't used Cold Fusion, so um, I don't know what generators are available. Yeah. But everything I've shown you was hand done. At a cost of uh, probably a billion man hours is my <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Any other questions? Thanks very much for coming. Appreciate it.